in 1807, Napoleon Bonaparte instructed his marshals to lead a stealth invasion of the Iberian Peninsula. Through a series of political machinations on the part of the French and incompetent governance on a part of the Spanish, French troops end up occupying almost the entirety of the Iberian Peninsula with the notable exception of Portugal. Portugal was the lone continental holdout that remained allied with Great Britain and refused to join Napoleon's continental system. Napoleon sent General Junot to the Portuguese frontier along with an ultimatum that they seize any British naval vessels operating in their waters and refuse port to any British merchantmen. The royal family of Portugal dithered and delayed the response to Junot and Napoleon as well. Ultimately, the Portuguese did acquiesce to most of the French demands, but it was too late, and the French, led by General Junot, crossed into Portugal with nearly 20,000 men. In the meantime, the unexpected nationalistic fervor of the Spanish themselves ultimately led to the Dos de Mayo uprising on May 2nd, 1808, in response to Napoleon's installation of his brother on the Bourbon throne while basically kidnapping the Bourbon king and his son. After hearing of the widespread result, revolts in Spain and the conquest of their only continental ally, Britain moved unusually fast and committed more than 15,000 troops to the Iberian campaign under the command of Sir Arthur Wellesley, later to become the first Duke of Wellington. That campaign morphed into a seven-year-long bloody war marked with savage guerrilla actions, fast, fast marches, and bloody sieges, forging what would come to be seen as one of the finest armies Great Britain has ever fielded. These were the opening salvos of the Peninsular War. Wellesley had initially been given complete command of the expedition, but through a series of political maneuvers, found himself fourth in command behind the prior garrison commander of Gibraltar, Hugh Whiteford Dalrymple. The expeditionary force landed at Mondego Bay, about 200 kilometers north of Lisbon, after a clash at Holisa, spelled Rolica, where Sir Arthur Wellesley defeated General Delaborde's understrength contingent. Wellesley and the British continued their southern march, but were stopped by General Junot at a small town of Vimiero, settled at the base of deep valleys and surrounded by rivers and stream. In today's game, we will refight this battle of Vimiero. Welcome to another Sacred Mountain Battle Report. This is a brief overview of the battlefield that we'll be fighting over today. We're looking north with the central village of Vimiero. This is the southerly coastal road to Marfa. The Masera River converging west of Vimiero. The British camp. Toledo in the northeast portion of the road to Ventosa. Just west is that road from the Peniche Peninsula. And here are the easterly approaches to the battlefield and the southern main road to Torres Verdes and Lisbon beyond. I separated the two teams, British and French. The British will deploy first, but there is a tactical decision that they have to make. Similarly, the French have to make a strategic decision prior to the game. Here is the battle briefing for the British. Uh, this is the British deployment. Guys, tell me how or what you are looking at for this battle and tell everybody about the special rules that we've done for this particular battle. All right, so uh, what we got going is we have uh, hidden troops. So this brigade and this brigade are both. So this is the first brigade bolstered by the Portuguese. Okay. And then this is the second brigade? Second brigade, yes. Second brigade. Yeah. So Wellesley liked to deploy troops behind hills. And so that's what we're doing. We're deploying them behind the hill. So what our idea is, is that when we pull these troops off, even though they're still there, our enemy will come in and will say, hey, look at those cannons. They're kind of hanging out there by themselves. And then maybe they'll be foolish enough to try to assault the cannons. Uh, we are also, we think, 
French objective is to take the town. So we have garrisoned our rifles in the town. And we also have reserves behind the town to ready to bolster it in case they do. We also have taken the 7th Brigade and put them entirely in reserve. And then he has uh, this in reserve as well. And, and why do you have the 7th Brigade in reserve there? Well, um, because this is a campaign and we don't want to have everything but be in a fight all at once. We're there in case we need them. Cool. Uh, I think last but not least, our, our dragoons are way over there uh, because there's nice wide open spaces that we can do some flanking if we need to. Great. Hey, thanks guys. So like I said, these are tactical decisions that the British are facing. And these are pictures of the hidden squad that's, or those hidden battalion brigades that are in the shadow of those hills per Wellesley's now famous deployment style. Now we'll move on to the French strategic battle briefing. With the French commanders, uh, they are doing a strategic kind of plan for the whole, for the beginning of the battle. They have not, they do not get to deploy first. The British do that, and I've already covered them. Uh, their uh, strategic phase really occurs more at the end of the battle. Uh, but here, the French are having to plan what exactly they're going to throw against Wellesley. And what have you guys decided? I think overall we've decided that our primary objective is to, is to interrupt Wellesley's march on Lisbon while we pull in some of our outlying forces and let things develop and take the measure of the man. He, uh, he rolled us up at a very small battle in Malika, and I, whatever the next battle in the campaign was, I think it was Busaco, uh, and he was using ridges and elevations and developing his reverse slope technology or strategy. And uh, Larry wisely observed there's a lot of broken ground on this battlefield. Uh, so we're going to try to let the broken ground do some of the work for us in interrupting his approach while we bring up you know, some of our guys. Why don't you explain? Before Larry gets started, he's, a little bit of explanation should be given to you guys. So this is the map that I gave them. In 1808, this is the disposition of General Junot's battalions. They're scattered throughout southern Portugal and then one far, far eastern Spain, the Legion du Medi. You can see in the greater Lisbon area in the bottom left corner, there are a total of seven battalions, seven battalions that are doing different things. Some are on general garrison, some are occupying the Tagus estuary forts. Two of them are guarding Spanish prisoners. Then just north is the Peniche Peninsula. There are, there's a single battalion guarding uh, the Peniche Peninsula at a fort, and then one at Savarum and one at Elvis. Now, if the French decide with limited data, I didn't give them much data, if they decide that they want to empty these forts out, they want to empty the town, that will have significant repercussions in the strategic phase at the end of the game. So this is a tough, this is a pretty big decision that these guys are making right now. Show me on the map too, Larry. Okay, so the, the ones that we're going to bring in, uh, we're leaving six of the brigades, or five of the brigades, down here in Lisbon. Some of them to guard prisoners, some of them just to hold the garrisons. We're going to bring in the the 4th Swiss to come from the East Syria. Peninsula? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then uh, Hanover, we're going to bring them in also. From Santarem? Yeah. And then um, just... How about uh, the Eastern Portuguese at the Fort Elvis? No. What are you doing with them? No? Yeah, we're going to leave, El we're gonna leave, leave Elvis. Leave Elvis. And then, yeah. and what about the uh, Spanish, uh, Eastern Spain? Eastern Spain's out. They're, they're staying too. They're staying okay, too. so you have a total of five battalions that you're leaving yes. in Lisbon and the surrounding areas to yeah. remain on garrison duty yes. for the campaign. So from Lisbon, the 26th, the 32nd and the 66th are all going to come. We have no intention of force marching anyone. Yeah, so I gave the, so. them an option of force marching to arrive sooner. Yeah. Uh, the Lisbon uh, contingents 
will be arriving at the end of turn one. Uh, Santrum Elvis uh, will arrive at the end of turn three, unless they are force marched. Mm. Are you guys force marching any of those guys? I think that mm. we're thinking we want to force march one battalion just to see what the effect is under your. So yeah. Okay, so, so you guys are going Santarum, to Santarum then. Yeah. yeah. Santarum. So yeah. the third division, second and uh, the second brigade, first Hanoverian battalion will force march, uh, and uh, they will arrive uh, also at the end of turn one. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's it. And then if we can maybe use the cavalry on the flanks and maybe hopefully try to funnel them a little bit towards us. Maybe be able to take advantage of that but who knows what they'll come up with alright boys so uh, your turn for deployment well you've already seen the British deployment so we'll show you the French this is the French left with uh, the 1st Cavalry Brigade 2nd and 1st Battalion and don't forget there's an infantry brigade hiding behind that hill and Larry's contingent with another brigade from the cavalry division and his infantry, shock infantry, lining up. This deployment turns out to be very similar to the actual Battle of Vimiero, which I think is super cool. Turn one, French won the skirmish phase and left both their generals in camp for more momentum. Larry is bombarding needing fours to hit, both hit. Larry's doing some advancing in the meantime, and those two hits fail to disrupt. Next is Junot's battery firing into the British on the other side of Vimiero. The roll to hit, needing fours. The roll to disrupt, needing sixes. Ouch. Scooped. Now here comes some British retribution. He was only supposed to roll four dice here, not five, or not. He was only supposed to roll three dice, not four. But he hits all four nonetheless. Fortunately, when he rolls to disrupt, it's a bust. Lots of maneuvering on the southern flank. Junot's come around, but is still not within four base widths of those hidden infantry on that terrain piece. In a demonstration march by the British, we have a flanking cavalry that's not flanking anymore. They're going to run around the hill and go right up the middle at that French camp. Unfortunately, all those reinforcements from Lisbon are coming right in the front door. And also, unfortunately for Jason, those French are coming in from the Peniche Peninsula right on his left flank. That is the end of status phase, turn one and French reinforcements arrive. French win, turn two skirmish, eight to four, awarding two extra momentum. Larry utilizes his general in the intervention phase for emergency formation change, and then volleys. That's two hits. In two disruptions, Jason is allowed to interrupt. Tiss, tiss, Jason. British guns only roll three dice, not four, but gets three hits. Now the bounce is on sixes. No hits. Second bounce on sixes. One hit. Rolling for disruptions on cannon, 
needing sixes. One disruption. I think I missed the cavalry, but I doubt he disrupted. Here I had to adjudicate whether or not the next gun could hit. So when we're calculating bounces and flight trajectory, it's just a thin line. But when looking to see if there's friendly fire in the way of friendly units intervening, it's one base width and width. And here we're saying that that does not enter into the forest and therefore is not shooting through terrain. If he was shooting through terrain, he could only go one base width beyond the forest. Sorry, Larry. Despite my ruling in his favor, Jason still rolls four dice instead of three for his British guns. Fret not, I will think of a suitable punishment for him next game. One hit. No disruption. After Larry's fusillade, Jason interrupts and returns fire, only receiving five dice. Two hits. Two disruptions. The French interrupt and take the initiative back, creeping precariously close to some hidden British on the left. And on the right, the French advance and reveal the first of two hidden British brigades. Undeterred, French Elan presses the attack. A bombardment into the British, actually Portuguese. Two hits. No disruptions. The British right backsteps across the river, inviting the French to charge, thus revealing the second hidden brigade if they decide to take the bait. The British left also giving ground across the river. The cautious Junot opens up with a bombardment across the battlefield. One hit. Their second bombardment into the taunting British. Three hits. That should have only been three hits, Byron not four. Two disruptions. Contrary to General Junot, Joe plays it safe on the French left and refuses to advance, keeping that British brigade unrevealed. The British cavalry makes an impetuous lunge at the French camp. Meanwhile, there's heavy fighting in the north. Reforming to mass, the cavalry can only move two base widths near the enemy unless they're charging. They won't make it. Turn two ends with indecision on the French left and bold attack on the French right. The British need momentum and keep both their generals in camp, gaining D3 each. Effective British skirmishing gives them a total of 10 skirmish points, resulting in a British victory. 10 skirmish points to French, six skirmish points. British guns with counter-battery bombardment. Six dice, six hits. One disruption. Next, British 
advance along a wide front, interpenetrating and moving through terrain, costing them three momentum. Advancing within four base widths of the French causes an interruption. Enjoy some uninterrupted shots north of Vimero. Enough of that already. Now for some French bombardment. Cock die, seven hits. Rolling for disruption on those impetuous British cavalry, two disruptions. In a shout of Vive la Empire, the French charge up the hill to the outnumbered British line. The French each strength six, getting a one bonus because they outnumber the British, rolling a one and a six in the background. The British roll a one of defeat for the British regardless of strength, thus awarding the French with the first huzzah tokens of the game. The initiative was seized by the Portuguese and British, and they take revenge with a smoky fusillade into the French flank. Seven hits total. Four disruptions. Ouch. Heedless of losses, the French will press the attack, expending their huzzah tokens. First we roll to see if the artillery retires. Larry rolls a three, and sometimes talent just needs a little nudge from the director. Too much table talk. Roll it, Jason. A three, he withdraws. The weakened French battalion presses the attack and charges the artillery battery. It's even money. A total of five for the British and four for the French. Attackers outscored equals a disruption and a base width at least retreat. French return fire with canister from the hill, statistically beating odds. Rolling to disrupt. Only one. Meanwhile, on the British right is the doomed charge of the Light Brigade. Squared up British take a shot each at the 1st and 2nd 70th battalions. No hits. The battered French 70th line makes a feeble rally attempt. Needing fours because they're near the enemy, only making two successes, causing three permanent disruptions. Meanwhile, the French decimate the British 20th Dragoons. No quarter was given the British 20th Dragoons. Throwing caution to the wind, the French press on a suicidal attack on the right.
four hits. But only one disruption into the cannon with a six. Suspiciously, the French stay out of range of the hidden British brigade. Has there been a traitor? And this is how it stands at the end of turn two. Cautious French on the left and a bold attack on the right. Impetuous cavalry charges in the British center. Four skirmish phase swings wildly in favor of the British with 14 skirmish points to the French two skirmish points. This awards the British six extra momentum. Junot's caution on the French left has paid dividends and he finally sees a hidden British brigade. Sensing French weakness with momentum to spare the British make multiple charges and move in for the kill. These end, as you might expect, for the doomed French. Multiple battalions routed. The only luck the French right would see today is being able to withdraw their guns in the face of the Portuguese line. The British right braces for a French attack that will never come. Sacre bleu! The French general on the right is a butcher, feeding more men into the teeth of the British. Initial combat values seem to favor the French. And it does. The top French and British are 8 and 11 respectively, and the outnumbered British are 9, to 9 and 13 versus the British 6. It's a push. Attritional warfare in the north. Each side will lose a battalion. expenditure of a Huzzah token in the Portuguese sees a rear charge into the French and that will end the day. 
the French give way. What? Say that again? The Portuguese are going to try to take the lead. And then Byron's just sitting over here with a completely intact army. Holding the road to Lisbon. What's that the road to? Uh, it's the Lisbon. road from Marfa, so Marfa. It's the coastal road south road to Lisbon. To road south, road we came in on. We needed to secure both. You actually, you actually came in on this road along the river. I did. And then <laughs> Port, Port, Porto Novo is where your fleet is now. Okay. See, I think this game would have been a lot better if you had taken my advice. <laughs> no, really. I mean, you was, you okay. All right. So, guys, for this game, sorry to interrupt, Joe. Um, how would you classify it? as a major, minor defeat or victory for your side? Oof. Looking at it from my point of view, it looks like we wiped out half the French and we held our road to continue going towards our objective. And uh, that's what it looks like to me. So I would say at the very least it is a minor victory, if not a major. Byron? I would agree with Jason that it's a solid minor victory, and um, if we're going on to play additional battles with troops with maybe some type of reinforcements, um, the British are holding a strong upper hand to be classified by this major. Okay. Joe, what do you think? I think that, that Jason, I'd like to know that's that's a coastal road, so it just sort of goes along the coast of Portugal. Yes. Okay. All the way down to Lisbon. Okay. It's about thirty I think it's about twenty to thirty kilometers inland. So you have a road that will take you to Lisbon, and we have a direct road to Lisbon that goes through Torres Vedras. So we can still insert the army between your guys and Torres Vedras, and we still have an army. Well, there isn't that much, but uh, there's still an army. Well, just because they're gone doesn't mean they're no, completely no. dead. I assume that you know, his stragglers will come right. back and his wounded will heal and, and Jason will push her if you want to battle for it. Right. You know, it's well, so, like, so look, back, back to my original question. Major or minor? I think it's a strategic stalemate. But there's no, no draws. It's major or minor defeat for you. Or win. Major or you could say major or minor victory. Uh, no. I, I was playing the work them, not recognizing that that road would also get them towards Lisbon. So recognizing that they can now use that road to go to Lisbon, the problem becomes, since they didn't wipe us out here, if he goes down that road, we cut his road to the coast. Well, I would assume the ships would continue south to mirror the army. Look at the map. Uh, well, they didn't need a port to come into uh, Mandego Bay. They had an amphibious assault. They just came ashore. So, back to the question. Major or minor defeat? I would have to say, if, if you're going to offer me the choice of major defeat or minor <laughs> defeat, I will simply abide by the game master's decision. What do you think it was? It's not for me to decide. Well, if the only choice is was a defeat, which well, I wouldn't call this a victory. I wouldn't call it a victory. We, I fought for a stalemate, but apparently that's not an option. So if, if that's not an option, I would have to say that it's a minor defeat for the French. Okay. We've decided that it's a minor victory for the British and a minor defeat for the French. Now, the French in the strategic phase have the option to request a parlay with the general in command, General Dalrymple. Sorry, that's Dalrymple, stupid British. You request parlay? Yeah, we request parlay. Roll a d6. What's d6? We're gonna find out. 
So because it was a minor defeat, Joe has a plus one. He needs to roll a three or higher. Two. What does that take? Okay. It gives me a three. General Dararimple, un- unlike what happened in real life, refuses parlay, and the convention of Sintra is not reached, and you have the option to continue the battle here or retreat to Lisbon. So in other words, what are the terms by which we continue the battle here? This is it. This is where the troops are this is, this is This is the afternoon uh, of the battle. The sun's setting. Well, we will retire to Lisbon. Okay. So, uh, in the strategic phase, your army is left with the field. What will you be doing? Will you be marching on to Lisbon? Well, uh, capture of Lisbon would be morale, would be pretty heavy against your morale. It would give us support. Um, we outnumber you at this point, but it would be probably siege if you make it there before we do. Um, I think that my superiors in London would want nothing less than Recall that at the beginning of the game, the French were given options to bring in multiple reinforcements from all across southern Portugal and eastern Spain. They opted to leave eastern Spain the Legion du Midi. They also opted, crucially, to leave the troops, the Second Swiss, at, at the fort at Elvis in eastern Portugal. They force marched Santorum into the battle, gaining one disruption. Also, they left the 31st and 32nd lights guarding the Spanish prisoners, which if they would have left the Spanish prisoners unguarded, they would have escaped, awarding British with partisans for the following games. Most crucially, the French left a garrison at the Tagus estuary forts, the most impregnable built in the 16th century is pictured here, courtesy of Google Earth. Now I've utilized Henry Hyde's Wargaming Campaigns book to decide on who the ultimate winner was. As impressive as that fort looks, I gave it a second class rating. In addition, at that top chart, I gave the attacker's advantage at 3 to 2, although the British Navy potentially could have increased that to 2 to 1 this crucial port surely would have not been left unguarded by what little French. Therefore, this second class fort with an attacker's advantage of three to two would have taken eight weeks to breach the wall. Thus besieged, Junot would have requested relief from the French. The French still reeling in defeat at the hands of General Castaños at Bailen with DuPont in full retreat, Napoleon enters Spain. Marching about 15 miles per day, we calculated that a relief army of up to 80,000 men could reach Lisbon in 48 days. However, had the French withdrawn from the fort at Elvis and used that single battalion in the battle today, it would have doubled French relief time as it lies astride the main road from central Iberia. Therefore, without the convention of Sintra and with the siege of Lisbon, Wellington's army in the peninsula met its first defeat and had to withdraw. Lisbon was retained by the French. And thus are the fortunes of war. Keep in mind that these are all true orders of battle taken from the Nafsinger collection, translated into La Salle ease. Then I designed this scenario around a major or minor victory or defeat using Henry Hyde's rules for sieges and some homebrew rules for the convention of Sintra. I hope you join me on the next Sacred Mountain Battle Report.